Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of the Dean and Chapter once more, welcome to Liverpool Cathedral. I'm guessing these are all familiar faces, so you probably know who I am by right now, uh, uh, and the organiser of these lectures. But it is a delight to welcome you to this, the last of the in-person lectures for 2023. For more information on the series, uh, do have a look at the information sheets, and indeed, once we've completed our series with this superb talk that Jeff's going to give us tonight. All of the recordings will then be linked to that website. So in a few weeks time, you'll, I'll put a notice in the e-news so that you should be able to get, get, uh, get the recordings on demand, as they say, within the, this parliamentary. Uh, as you've very kindly done last time, if you can fill in an evaluation sheet, um, please do so. I'd love to get your, your feedback on this evening. Uh, and of course, if you can, as you have already done so in these three weeks preceding, if you can give a donation, that would be very, very much appreciated for the work that we're doing here in Lillington. So without further delay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Reverend Professor Jeff Astley. Jeff, as you'll see on the information sheets, the short biography, is very well known academic and researcher. This small, and it is just a small extract of his biography shows you. Jeff is presently Honorary Professor of Theology and Religion at Durham University. He is the Alistair Hardy Professor at Bishop Grosseteste University in Lincoln and Visiting Professor at York St. John University. His presence with us tonight is made possible through the generosity of the Montgomery Trust, an international trust which has helped provide expert lecturers for the Gilbert Scott series since we began in 2019. And tonight is no exception. Jeff brings an unrivaled experience and expertise to our in-person series this year. So, everyone, with his lecture on God, Gaia, and goodness, the nature of nature and of the divine, please welcome the Reverend Professor Jeff Ast. Thank you very much. Well, the best thing about this lecture, I think I can say, without fear of contradiction, is the title. Um, and among all those words, the one that sticks out like a sore thumb is Gaia. So perhaps we could begin talking a little bit about Gaia. And Gaia particularly recently has been associated with the name of James Lovelock and his Gaia hypothesis or theory. Jim Love, Lovelock, uh, I knew his work from some years ago, at least superficially, uh, but um, my interest was piqued on, I think it was the 26th of July last year, when he managed to die exactly on his 103rd birthday, and it was then that I discovered that he was living two miles away in Portisham, uh, from where my younger son had recently moved and my younger son uh, trained as a journalist. So if only he lived a bit longer, maybe I could have uh, got him here to give this lecture uh, or at least record an interview with him. Uh, Jim Lovelock uh, was an independent scientist, came from humble origins. His mother worked in a pickle factory and his father had been in prison uh, for poaching. He, slightly later in life than most people, trained as a chemist at Manchester University, got a PhD there, and then did some work in medical research. Uh, he was also an inventor. One of the things he invented was the electron capture uh, device, which was able to find small quantities of chemical compounds in atmospheres and this helped to find uh, the problem of the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, and the ozone layer. Lovelock um, worked uh, initially with a, bi uh, a biologist, microbiologist, an American, Lynn Margulis. Uh, Lovelock was not himself a biologist, and in some ways that shows in his 
theory. But he became famous for the Gaia hypothesis, later called the Gaia theory. And I've brought some, most of his books along here, and you'll see some of them uh, use that wonderful picture. I think that's from the Apollo 17 mission. Uh, young people here, so before your time. Uh, wonderful picture of the Earth as this, this white and blue living globe out in the pitch blackness of space. And it, this was clearly an icon for him. The th notion of, these are the last two books uh, that he produced, and he wrote the last one, uh, Novacine, uh, when he was, I think, 99. The name Gaia was not his coinage. Uh, it was suggested to him by his neighbour, William Golding, uh, the novelist, uh, on a walk, if only we had friends like that to suggest it. He said, you know, if you're going to make a big deal of this, you need a name for it. And Gaia was the name, and Gaia is the name of a Greek goddess. We could look into uh, Greek mythology if necessary, but I don't advise you to, if, especially in these hallowed halls, uh, but she was the personification of the earth, and like all Greek gods, um, she in involved herself very closely with her children, having children of her own by them. We move on quickly. Lovelock's Gaia doesn't take over those elements from mythology. Uh, rather, it, it takes the view that there is a system one thing comprising both the environment of life and life itself. Biota is the Sunday best word for all living things. The biosphere is that part of Earth's environment that sustains life. It goes up 47 miles into the atmosphere, goes down 12 miles, is it more, down into uh, the deep sea vents. And his idea can be summarized quite succinctly. It was this, that this largest creature on earth, as he puts it, is the creature that is sustaining life. It is one system. In this sense, he says, the earth is alive. Clearly much of it is dead just dead rock and much of the biota is extinct in fact 99% of species that have ever lived are in fact extinct so his Gaia hypothesis theory doesn't preclude death and extinction but that as a unity as a system the environment and life together allows us to talk about the earth as alive not in a sentient way, he says, or not like an animal or a bacterium. In other words, the claim is metaphorical. But he does actually milk, milk this metaphor uh, quite considerably. He talks about Gaia showing revenge in the title of one of his book against our pollution. He talks of her being stern and ruthless, having authority. But this is metaphorical speech, and he recognises this. He says Gaia is intelligent in the same way that a thermostat is intelligent. He's speaking more as an engineer, even than a scientist, a natural scientist. Uh, but he's certainly not speaking as a biologist. So here are the two components of Gaia, the environment and life. Since before Darwin, it was recognized that the environment has an effect on life, and that effect uh, Darwin spoke of as natural selection. Um, but Lovelock added a reverse effect, that life has an effect on the environment. Life 
makes itself, sustains the conditions for its own existence. Life makes the environment, the earth, comfortable for its life. So in this two-part component, we think of the earth's surface conditions, and we're thinking of things like the temperature of the land and the sea, um, the salinity of the oceans, uh, the gas composition of the atmosphere. So the salinity of the oceans is about 3.5%. If it rose to 5%, that would mean the death of all life in the oceans. The oxygen in the, in, uh, the atmosphere is about 21%. If it rose much above that, Lovelock claims, under certain circumstances, then forest fires would rage throughout the earth. It is in an unstable equilibrium, and it's kept in, an, in that equilibrium with the proper, the right, the useful proportion of different gases kept in that by life itself, sustaining the conditions for its own existence. Take temperature. He talks here about, and I'll express this, um, articulate this more in, in a moment, about the constancy of temperature, but he's not really talking about it staying the same, and it clearly doesn't stay the same. What he's talking about is that the temperature in Earth's surface conditions, not in the depths of the oceans, not beyond, up into the atmosphere and the stratosphere, but in the surface conditions are kept, the temperatures are always kept favorable for contemporary life. In a later book, he described this as his Gaia hypothesis and replaced it by what he called his Gaia theory, that surf the surface conditions of the Earth are as favorable as possible for contemporary life. Now, this is not a distinction that philosophers of science would make between hypotheses and theory, but this is how he, he makes that distinction. But there are um, points that have been raised against this view, and he is willing to accept many of them. For a start, the equilibrium in the atmosphere, say, and the temperature is also caused by many physical, not biological, uh, events and phenomena. Um, sea spray, weathering of rocks, volcanoes all affect temperature and the atmosphere and so on. And also, he is a bit equivocal, ambivalent about the use of the term consciousness. We'll see this in more detail in a moment. It does appear from what he's saying that the idea of all life together being considered as a unit and affecting the atmosphere suggests some sort of interrelation, communication between living things, coordinating that environmental feedback, and most biologists would regard that as implausible. But here's a temperature um, graph. It goes back to the Cambrian, and the Cambrian period is important back here. Um, not bright enough. Uh, at the left-hand side of the screen, because of what is called the Cambrian explosion in life forms. So the Cambrian's about um, 50, 500 million years before the present, 500 million years ago. But this. Um, situation is a long time after uh, the forming of the Earth. The Earth was formed probably 4.6 billion thousand million years ago. But life began pretty soon after that, certainly by 3.8 billion years ago and probably much earlier. It simply wasn't fossilized, so we don't know about it. But some of the earliest fossils of microorganisms, although there's conjecture and doubt about them, go back to about 4.6 million years. B 
billion years ago. So for a very long time, there is life on the Earth, but it's simply unicellular life, and gradually multicellular organisms, plants and then animals, uh, evolve. And then in the Cambrian, we have an explosion. So this temperature scale traces it back to the uh, Cambrian. And you can see uh, the scale along the bottom uh, gets drawn out as we get nearer and nearer to uh, the present uh, time. But you can see that the Earth has cooled despite massive changes in the solar output and the radiation, the heat radiation hitting the Earth. And you can see in the extreme right-hand side the effect which is related to human beings. So hominids evolved probably two million years ago. Our species, Homo sapiens, probably 300,000 years ago. Hardly any time at all. Um, uh, I, I read a book once, and I forgot to bring it, and I forgot what it's called, and I've forgotten the title, but it was a good book. Uh, and this book says, think about the the life of the earth as being beginning in the first of the title page of this book, then human beings arrive somewhere around the last page, the last couple of lines, sorry, mammals arrive then, and the human, human history is the last full stop on the last page. We are very recent. But we can at least, when we look at uh, temperature, have some very good data about the effect that we have had on the environment since uh, the, the end of the 19th century. This is a measure of the extent to which the Earth's average temperature has increased above the average mean temperature uh, for those last 50 years of the 19th century. And you can see it's getting closer and closer to the dreaded 1.5. Uh, degrees centigrade. And Lovelock was very concerned about um, global heating caused largely by environmental pollution. More of that later. How is it that the Earth has managed to stay stable and the temperature stay favourable for life? Well, by complex feedback effects. The one on the left hand side of the screen relates to life. There's life at the bottom, enhanced phytoplankton growth, producing various sulfur products which help the condensation of clouds which reflects the sun's light and heat, preventing the oceans warming too much. Um, uh, more difficult to read, perhaps, is the oxygen cycle, set of cycles on the right-hand side of the screen, where you can see respiration and photosynthesis, uh, middle right, two circles there, human, sorry, animal and plant um, processes that take in oxygen or produce oxygen. And this oxygen is cycled, some of it buried, some of it coming from out of weathering of rocks and going into the atmosphere, maintaining a constant 21% of oxygen. But I want to talk mainly about the influence and relevance of Gaia in a more religious perspective. It has to be said that his most immediate and vociferous influence was in New Age spiritualities and some forms of green spiritualities, who identified a named being, God, as conscious, a mythic goddess, Lovelock rather disparagingly calls it, quasi-divine. That is not his view. More positively, and from the point of view of science, and particularly from the point of view of biology, at least his view is holistic. It looks at the whole rather than murdering to dissect the parts and then dealing with the whole in terms of the most simple proper 
qualities of those parts. It's not reductionist. And it's terribly important, particularly in biology, to recognize that there are some uh, things that happen, some phenomena that appear only when a, a, a living organism is a whole and doesn't, not representative of its parts. Uh, it emerges, these qualities emerge, and very often they emerge through the organization of the parts. Think of the importance of the organization of the base codes along the famous DNA double helix. Information uh, uh, coded there emerges to produce new things that were not there before. Now what I want to do mainly this evening is to look at the similarities between the idea of God or more broadly religious conceptualities and the idea of Gaia as Lovelock presents it. First of all then, the similarities. Gaia, writes Lovelock, is a religious as well as a scientific concept. Unfortunately, my younger son was not there with his, uh, uh, his notepad to query what he meant by this. In many ways, I think he was talking about it as a spiritual concept rather than a religious concept. He was brought up a Quaker but very quickly became an agnostic and it's clear from reading his works he doesn't have much of a taste for religion. Nevertheless, he's willing to um, admit in interviews with people who press him that there is this religious slash spiritual dimension to his concept. Importantly, both are described in metaphors and they are often described anthropomorphically. God is described in metaphors because we cannot possibly have a literal description of that which is transcendent over us, different from us, in ways that I shall explain more about in a moment. Metaphors or similes, as Jesus uses in the parable, the kingdom of God is like, are ways of expressing things that cannot be literally said. For as the famous 20th century theologian put it, God is in heaven and we are on earth. And unfortunately our language is earthly language, learnt at our mother's name, referring to things that we can see and touch and feel. So necessarily when we try to apply this to God, we are accused of being anthropomorphic, uh, describing God in the form of a human being. Uh, the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And many, many, many more biblical references and hymns and prayers. Of course we do. What else have we got except human language to use it? It's interesting. But Gaia seems so far from the straightforward science that Lovelock was doing. After all, he became a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, that he feels it is can only be described metaphorically as God is. Lovelock also, interestingly, allows for an element of intuition in the scientific thinking that he does uh, that comes up with the concept of Gaia. Gaia is not easy to explain because it is a concept that arises by intuition, he says, uh, by which, of course, he means non-discursive, non-rational. This is not part of a syllogism where you have premises and it leads to a conclusion, either deductively or inductively, um, either going up from generalities to a conclusion or deducing one thing from another, unpacking concepts to get other concepts and claims. Now, religious knowledge has and does and necessarily uses rational deduction and inference. 
but clearly it's usually accepted now that there are no arguments for the existence of God that work as arguments. So mostly people claim that the notion of God also arises in an intuition, but they call it sense ex religious experience. That is to say, it is not rationally thought up, but it comes to people in a moment of experience. And that's not a million miles away from the way that our sense data come to us in something which we later discursively discuss, name and produce details of and argue about. But first of all, we have looking up there a yellow patch that we see. And even to call it yellow is to compare it with other things that are yellow. But there's some element of intuition even in sense experience. So we're not a million miles away from uh, intuitive thinking in religion. And it's interesting that Lovelock allows its place in science also. And there's a couple of things about the use that, and the effect of the Gaia hypothesis that I think also chime with religious language and its uses. For a start, it is powerful in evoking respect for nature, wonder at nature, even love for nature. Evocative way, evoking attitudes and values and expressing attitudes and values. And attitudes and values are key, partly because they are the springs of behavior. It's not as if religious people have a set of doctrines which immediately relate to behavior. I think what happens is that those doctrines give rise to attitudes and values, and those are much closer to the motivations for human behavior. So expression and evoking is part of religious language as well as Gaia language. And at some point, uh, Lovelock says, God should, sorry, Gaia should be a way to view the earth, ourselves, and our relationship with living things. It should be a way of seeing it. It should be a perspective on it. And this has been said and indeed my slip of the tongue there did say it, of God also, and of religious language also. Um, that it is not meant to refer to some reality, rather it is to get us to see the things that are in front of our eyes differently, to see the world as God's world, to see other people as God's children, to see our death as something positive. I think the sense in which Lovelock is using a religious or spiritual conceptualization is partly this, that he sees it as a way of looking on the world and living appropriately in it. Nevertheless, both Gaia and God are claimed to be real. Both Lovelock and religious folk claim that their attitudes and values and perspectives are based on some reality. There is something really there, out there, in both science and theology. So let's talk a little bit about the there-ness, the out thereness of God. Lovelock insists that he's not simply talking pantheism. Pantheism is the view that all things are God. Rather, he would say, but didn't, it's a form of panentheism. All in Godism. And that's a very reputable way for Christians and Muslims and Jews, that is, theists, to think of their God. What he does say is that Gaia is both of this universe and conceivably a part of God when pressed. He says, astonishingly, really, somewhere tucked away in one of these books, Mary could be another name for Gaia or an embodiment 
of God. So we've got different ways of thinking of God, which are not a million miles away from religious ways of thinking of God. But let me be more simple-minded. If the arrow in front of you here represents the spatio-temporal universe, all things in space and time, going in a direction, then if that is all there is, we label that naturalism, as opposed to any form of supernaturalism. The world alone exists. If, however, you want to believe in God, but don't think there's anything other than the world, you're a pantheist. The world is God, God is the world. And my color for God uh, is sort of dark, and my color for nature is white. Got it the wrong way around, but you can't do everything. God is world shape in pantheism. But this is panentheism, one or other of these slightly different pictures. On the left-hand side of your screen, God, circular, grey, undergirds the world. The world is in God in that sense. Or, more radically, the right-hand side of the screen, with the broken line, God is... The world is a part of God, of the same substance as God. God's substance is more than, greater than, other than, elsewhere than the world, but the world is God, more than God. But what about the differences? This clarifies, I think, to some extent, the doctrines uh, that I've been touching on here. God or Gaia, in no way, uh, Lovelock claims, do I see God, Gaia as a surrogate God. For him, God is not a teleological concept that is not about end or purpose. God, Gaia is not consciously and purposefully designing nature for itself as a part of itself. Whereas, of course, um, God is not a surrogate God, but the God for monotheists. And God is a teleological concept. And the universe is regarded as being consciously and purposefully designed by God. Now, I have to be a little careful here. This is footnote stuff. Because of his use of language... Lovelock sometimes, and especially towards the end of his life, did talk about the purpose of the universe and allowed that we were part of the purpose of the universe, of Gaia, the biosphere and the biota together. And that the purpose of the cosmos, he wrote, is to produce and sustain intelligent life. And in that sense, human beings have been chosen for that purpose. But early on and more clearly, this is not a conscious purpose. I think to a large extent he's still talking as an engineer and that might talk. What is the purpose of that part of that engine? It is to do that. But it's interesting how the difference between purposefulness in a religious concept and purposefulness for the engineer or for Lovelock's Gaia slip over easily into one another. Another difference. Gaia theory is not anthropocentric. It isn't focused on human beings. Good God does not work specifically for human life. So he's like those deep ecologists who don't want to put human beings on a pedestal as any more valuable than any other life form. We're just another species. And he's quite um, indignant about the religious idea uh, that we may be stewards of this planet. We're not bright enough for a start. But theism, belief in a personal God, is anthropocentric. Um, there's very very few religious traditions 
that do not overwhelmingly place a concern for human life above a concern for other forms of life. And according to an early verse in Genesis, um, God created humankind in his image. Gaia might have been created, Lovelock accepts in some interviews, but he has no real notion of the importance of creation in the way that theists do. In Christian theism and amongst Jews and Muslims and many Hindu theists also, God is creator and everything else is created. And that difference is absolutely key. The concept of creation makes all the difference. And it says a great deal about the nature, both of the universe and the nature of God. The difference creation makes essentially is that God is in a different category of being. Only one reality, according to monotheists, belong in this category. Only one thing is uncreated, one reality, and independent of other realities. Everything else, every single thing else, every event, every erg of energy, every subatomic particle, is created and therefore dependent. And that is key to uh, reflection on the two aspects of creation. I find with my own students, uh, who are often coming in to study theology from a religious background, uh, that they're surprised, not to say offended, when I tell them that they only have a half-baked notion of the doctrine of creation. They think of it as something that happened once a long time ago. It's then creation. But that was the beginning of the universe, back behind the Big Bang, back in metaphysical reality, where there is God, and then there is God and the universe. Very important the origin of all things from God. But equally important, and in fact spiritually and theologically perhaps more important, is the continuing power of God in creation now, sometimes called continuing creation. Creatio continua, uh, one theologian talks about, the incessant act of God keeping things in existence preservation, sustaining the world. And that is why everything now depends on the sustaining power of God. The, hu the, un <coughs> the universe, says um, another German theologian, so many of them are, Emil Brunner, the universe hangs down from God. Here are beautiful representations that I had made earlier. For you. Pendant lights hangs down on a divine thread of preservation above the abyss of nothingness down here. If God were to break that link, then all things would collapse into nothingness. And here's another pendant light in case uh, I couldn't find any in the cathedral. A rather nice one, I think. Uh, but my house is too small for that. So the picture we have of God on the view of theism is this right-hand one, not the left-hand one. Now, the word deism is used in a slight variety of ways, but let's just talk about radical deism. A deist is somebody who believes that God began the world and then left it alone, left it alone entirely. 
was not needed for the continuation of the world. He just did this thing like an engineer might or the stonemasons. The stonemasons who built this don't have to stay there keeping it up in existence. But God does. Creation isn't that sort of thing. And of course we have, when we talk about creation, we talk about making something, even something this wonderful, out of something else out of stones and wood and stuff, or if it's the creation of words out of, of, of a play, say, out of, out of words. Only God creates out of nothing. And that's why when God removes his sustaining presence, all things collapse into nothing. I don't know if you can make out this, but I like to think of spectra. But I like to think of the theology of divine activity in terms of the spectrum. At the left-hand side here, nature is more independent of God. At the right-hand side, God is more involved. And usually the distinction is made between what I've called uh, radical deism here, uh, at the left-hand extreme we have what I've called initial creation, beginning creation, making creation. The next stage is preserving creation. And it's getting more along this line of the spectrum. God is more involved with the world. And then the notion of providence, which is essentially the idea that God steers events in nature within the laws of nature, like you might steer a canoe via, along a river by the right bank or the left bank or in the middle, but still within the banks of the river. So you can't tell that the act of providence, the answer to prayer or God steering evolution is in any sense unusual, inexplicable by natural scientific laws. It's within the bounds. Providence. It's only at this extreme end that we have intervention. That God doesn't just create and sustain. God doesn't just steer. God also sometimes intervenes. And these are miracles because they are outside the laws of nature. Now it's a familiar distinction, but I find it useful to see it as a continuous spectrum. And people in their theological position move left and right along that spectrum. From now on, the uh, pictures get rather more silly, but there we are. God's relation to the universe. It's not this. It's not like the scene that you see on your computer screen. As you write those words, you are providing the input. There is no causal relationship between the pixels on that computer screen. And after a few minutes, you might get tired and play a game on your computer screen. I recommend Angry Birds, it's, it, it's free. You can ignore the adverts. And this involves throwing birds at pigs. You know, how much fun can you have on a computer? But there is no causal relationship between the flying bird and the pig that's knocked off its pedestal or explodes. No causal relationship there. No true causal relationship in nature. This is one way in which God may make things happen in a regular way. And we talk about the laws of nature and what we're talking about is God's laws of succession. He'll always do this after he's done that. I believe that some Islamic theology holds up view. It is called voluntarism in the history of English Christian theology, Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century held such a view. But it is usually regarded as a heresy in Christianity. Instead of this, God's relationship to the universe is all about perspective. Think of yourself looking down on nature. 
looking down on it as if it were a pool table or a snooker table or a billiard table. Uh, anybody who uh, has not experienced these things, and some of you may not have done, like you've not experienced angry birds, obviously, uh, I can tell you later about uh, what you've missed in your childhood. Anyway, you might look down on this table from above, and you might envisage that the ricocheting of the balls between each other and the sides of the table as they go on are according to the laws of nature, because they are. And you might say, well, God came along first of all and hit the first cue ball, and they're, thereafter they're just ricocheting. That's his only contact with it. So you sort of forget about him, and there it is, and I couldn't get a better picture, and, and they're not ricocheting at all, but um, there we go. But that's not the view to take. It all depends which way you look. And it's always best to look under the table from the side. But anyway, there are real relationships in nature, real causal relationships on the surface of the table. But from the side, that is where you see God. Well, you don't, you see a table. But God stands for the table. Not just being the unmoved mover that sets everything going in the causal nexus, of the universe, but also sustaining it, keeping it in existence, keeping it up and running, keeping it going. God is the primary cause, says a philosopher, sustaining nature's secondary causality. But there is real causality there, and there wasn't in the first image. Here is God, hold not, pen, not hanging down the universe, but holding it up. A familiar image beneath of the everlasting arms from Deuteronomy and many a hymn and chorus. As creator, God is both different from the world, and we use the language of far off for what we should call transcendence, God's difference, God's otherness. As a creator, God must be in God's being different from everything else that exists. God's being is uncreated, independent being. And of course, beginning creation is far off in time, so two for the price of one. But God is also in religious parlance, close, near, technically immanent within the universe. In a phrase of Thomas Aquinas, present to all things as the continuing sustaining cause, keeping them in existence. Why is God omnipresent? Because God is present to all things. Wherever there is anything, there also is God. And continuing creation is not just in the past, it is from the past to through to the future and our future and beyond. Now we use many personal images, sometimes anthropomorphically, of God, and personal images for the act of creation. Here are a range of very familiar ones. You might like to reflect on which of those allow nature more independence despite the fact it's still being held in, in God's being. And of course, the problem with any analogy or metaphor for creation is that we do not see it happening. All we do is take something and make it into something else. We don't really create at all. But I like that one in particular because the speaker or the musician or the dancer, their creations only exist as they speak them, as they dance them, as they play them. And you may be familiar with the Shiva Nataraja, the Hindu god, lord of the god, creator and destroyer. Can we be more personal about God as creator? Really personal images have included the fact, the, the notion uh, that God is like the self or soul or mind of the universe and the universe like God's body. So somehow uh, God within the universe but a different nature, a different reality, mind, not matter. 
but that doesn't capture creation either. We've tended to go, at least in the Christian church, for parental imagery. And this captures both procreation, although babies are not made out of nothing, but out of sperms and eggs, but also the nurturing, continuing relationship. And very often this has been God as Father, and that is as far as it's got. But I like very much the quotation from the science and religion writer Arthur Peacock, who's a biochemist, who says, in mammalian procreation, the male creates outside himself and the female creates within herself. Think of God as creating the world. That is in principle and in origin other than him herself, other than God, but creates the world within herself. He doesn't show a picture of it, but I'm going to show a picture of it. I've done this very, very many times. I've never found anybody who really liked it, but I like it, so there it is. And that child is dependent on the mother, and the mother is interdependent with the child. If the child is lost in, in an abortion, um, then something has been taken from the mother and she will feel this loss. So it's not as if the world doesn't matter to God, that the world is just dependent on God and God is not in some sense at least emotionally dependent on the world. Now, there is no notion here of independent life for the fetus, but analogies can't do everything, and that does something that many things do not do. My final point is to solve the problem of evil, the most difficult problem facing any theist, and I haven't got much time left, so I'll try and do it as quickly as possible. Let's talk about goodness and evil in God. Gaia is impersonal and therefore amoral. Okay, Lovelock hedges it a bit because Gaia contains us and we're persons and morally culpable. So, uh, yeah, but basically he's talking about an impersonal environment with impersonal life mostly. But God isn't. God is through and through personal. And because God is personal, we can ascribe moral value to God. And we can claim that God is good or evil, and usually we have claimed God is good. And this has produced a major intellectual problem. There's always going to be a spiritual, psychological problem of coping with evil, but the theological problem is the problem of explaining it. The problem of explaining it, and it goes back a very long way, the problem of evil. Because if God wills to destroy evil or abolish it and if God can because he, God is omnipotent and omniscient and all creator how then is he good it's a problem about the goodness of God and evil is simply understood here as that which ought not to be some evil is moral evil caused by human beings or angels and devils if such there be personal agents, but most of it is natural evil caused by events of nature, and we know all about this. And the problem of natural evil is a real area where the shoe pinches for Christian theology. We can say that some evil in the universe is inevitable. Uh, Austin Farrer, an Anglican theologian, put it neatly. The mutual interference of systems is the grand cause of physical evil or natural evil. Because we occupy space, I occupy space. You happen to be sitting there. If I insist on sitting on the same chair you're sitting, there will be a mutual interference of systems. And there will be pain and suffering and probably a black eye. In, in other words, because we, if we were angels, we could, of course, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, don't you know this? Uh, any number, of course, because they don't have bodies, so they don't occupy space, so it's a silly question. A lot of evil is caused by that, of course, earthquake, volcano, stuff, the cancer in the lung, the fungus in the foot, occupying spaces. 
which when living things evolve to be sentient, feeling, cause pain. But there is also, and this is often not noticed, the biological inevitability due to natural selection. Natural selection itself is inevitable. Darwin didn't invent it, it's bound to happen. Have a population that is varied, apply, put them in an environment, and some will get on better, live longer, produce more offspring than others because of the variability. Some will, will be better adapted to the environment. And if there are many generations and you don't get evolution without death, then gradually they will evolve to be more better adapted to the environment, the whole population, because according to um, Darwin himself, if I can find the quote, uh, multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die is the law of natural selection. Multiply, vary, the strongest live, the weakest die. Darwin called, about the, called this the struggle for existence. Herbert Spencer later talked about um, the survival of the fittest and Darwin took over that phrase. But it involves some death. It has evolved extinctions, 99% of all species that have ever existed. It allows for, it makes almost inevitable the evolution of not just carnivores, but pathogens and parasites and predators. And there's SARS-CoV-2, the RNA virus, uh, that is still with us and causing through this complicated thing, although it's hardly alive, um, great disasters for human beings. A third possibility a third element in solving the problem of evil is to say that there are some virtues, second order virtues, that could only exist if there's pain and suffering in the universe. We wouldn't need courage otherwise, or compassion, or resistance to temptation, or anything. So maybe, and this is the view of one of my mentors, John Hick, if there was no pain or problems in an objective environment, Life would be like a reverie in which we should float and drift at ease. And when I say that to 18-year-old students, I can see they thought it was, really. But what the world really is, says the poet John Keats, is a world of soul-making. That is its point. That is its role. Which brings us appropriately, at the end, to eschatology the last things. Is there a good end for human beings? And here, uh, Lovelock seems to disagree with the religious position. In his view, we are to be replaced by cyborgs. We've got somehow to um, create artificial intelligences that will be able to survive as the planet gets hotter. That's our role, to create these. That's our purpose, he says. And at some point, and I can't find the reference, so don't ask me for it, but he did say, and at some point these cyborgs may become conscious. He seems quite happy with that, that human beings will be replaced on Earth by artificial intelligence. In fact, he calls it Novacine, the title of his last book, the last era, and it started, he said, in 2017 with the production of the computer program Alpha Zero. At that stage, computer programs can produce themselves. Computers can make themselves. They don't need us. We are the midwives, the parents of this good end. And he dies at the age of 103, happy. But I wouldn't. According to the Bible and Christian tradition and other theistic religions also, God is concerned with the survival, in some sense, of humans, either in a new earth, 
either in a new material universe, the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of the whole person, points to that, another universe maybe, or a different part of this universe. Or in what we have traditionally called heaven, where the angels live and God lives because they are immaterial, non-corporeal, discarnate, minds, spirits, without bodies, and therefore no physical pain can reach them, though suffering can. A very different view of the end. Uh, but that's all I have, really. Thank you very much.